never used to tell people, by the way, let me show you how to do it. I don't believe in that. Let me show you what works for me. Because there's a guy out there watching that's much smarter than I am, and he's going, this guy's doing it the hard way. I can do it a lot easier. <laughs> and that's why two heads are better than one. Mm -hmm. And I know that's why you keep Hot Rod Bob around. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody welcome back to our two tired guys production zoom studios in two separate locations for a brand new talking about cars where everybody has a car story i'm randy Cardew, and along with the one the only hot rod bob back yes but first before we get to the Matter at hand, which of course is a very interesting guest. Uh, I uh, basically continue to wear oh, the, yes. the long awaited look at the new Power Tube TV merch. We have uh, some good fun stuff coffee mugs. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where's the coffee get, mug? Get the coffee it. mug. Get the coffee mug out. Get there, mug. there it is. I don't You've know been mugged. See, there we go. And notice yeah. it's got the fire logo on it. So you can hot. you could drink your uh, hot coffee or your espresso. You could drink your uh, herbal tea, whatever your thing is. And you could do it in a talking about cars coffee mug. T-shirts, yes. we have those. Of course, they have this nice warm hoodie. And uh, where we are right now, still at this time of year, uh, as of we do this in April, it's still needed. I, I don't know. La Nina or whatever. Uh, it has our fire logo on it. Go to watchpowertubetv.com, hit the merch tab, and check out all of our fun talking about cars merchandise. Also, remember to watch us now on Roku, mm -hmm. Android TV, Smart TV, Apple TV, wait, wait, there's more, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, and PowerTube TV on the App Store. We also have Rumble and of course, YouTube. And, and we get ready to rumble. Right, right, right. There may be more that I haven't been told about that you never know. know. So that's that's our pre stuff and got that out of the way. All right. Good. As you know, no. if you followed this show for any amount of time, whether uh, even before we were doing it in video, uh, Bob and I have had some really great guests. We've had hosts, of yeah. uh, top hosts of some of the top TV car shows in history. We've we've talked to Motor Trends' John Davis. We have talked to NHRA legend Dave McClellan, Mike, Ed, Ant from Wheeler Dealers, Wayne Carini, Chip Foos, even a few words with Jay Leno and Scottsdale once upon a time when we first started the show. Today's guest, Bob, certainly a big name people are going to know. Yes, they will, especially if they... If they the start of automotive shows on TV and radio started with this gentleman and a different network, but he was part of the early days of the automotive shows. And the one that I got, I watched him with and, and found out about it was, uh, was I went blank, uh, was two guys, two guys. <laughs> a man garage. you'll never forget. A man you'll forget. It. What's his name? Yeah. <laughs> two guys garage. Now that matches up with us. You got two tired guys here and he was two guys garage. Yes. And it was one of the early shows. Not just, oh, look at the car in the background. It was, this is the part. This is how you fix it. And watch us put it on. So, And he did it with Dave Bowman. And they they were great. They, they were a good pair. And they were the start of what has become a whole industry and a whole segment of television. And we're part of it now. And a TV pioneer, considering yep. the guy never grew up wanting to be a TV pioneer of anything. In fact, maybe watching TV was his big thing. We'll have to ask him about it. So yeah. let's get to him. Uh, okay. you know, he's standing by. Let's go. You'll know him. The one, the only, Sam Amolo, ladies and gentlemen. Sam Amolo, joining us on the Talking About Cars podcast. This is my pleasure. This is... Thank you. Thank you for that. No, it's really our pleasure, actually. Yeah. We've been watching you on TV for so long, and and, and it's so great. We were talking about how we've the one thing, many things, but the one of the things that's so fun about doing podcasts is you get a chance to talk to people you've watched for so many years. We've 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 had John Davis from Motor Week. We've had Dave McClellan on the show. We've had we've had some really cool guests, and it's going to be so much fun. And it's so great that you were able to join us here. I I, I wanted to ask. 
No, yeah, you're in Alabama, apparently, right? You were telling us a little about that. Yes, sir. You retired well, out there. You know, or how did that happen? I'm originally a Boston. Long story, real quick, condensed. <laughs> I'm a Bostonian. Had a job that took me all over the country. I was living in Northern California in the 70s and uh, working as a field engineer. Traveled the whole Pacific Northwest. When I lost my dad, who was in Atlanta, so I moved to Atlanta to take care of mom and all the stuff that goes along with that. And I stayed there for 36 years. Um, it's grown. It's gotten real big. I wanted to be out in the woods. Alabama is a wonderful state. Found myself a little four-acre farm with a stream. I built a 3,600-square-foot steel building. I got a small house. I got a log cabin. You're welcome to come anytime, by the way, and stay in the cabin. It's fully equipped. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and but don't bring that hot rod Bob guy with you. <laughs> <laughs> My reputation precedes me. I'm yeah. a party guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so here I am. And, uh, you know, I've retired from TV and radio. And um, I just piddle around. I've got um, two tractors. And I like just playing. I'm not really a farmer. I don't pretend to be. But I am surrounded. I'm very rural. Uh, I can't see any neighbor's house from where I am. Therefore, when I'm pounding or welding or grinding or painting, nobody's bothering me because I don't bother anyone else. And I live almost on a corner. And on all the other three corners, I have neighbors that eat grass and poop and howl. I'm in Black Angus country. Oh, I thought vegetarian. There's a few chicken farms down the road. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, there are cows that come close to my fence that it's unbelievable. And you know, I grew up with dairy cattle in New England, but I was never around Angus beef. I never realized how loud they were. <laughs> Am I the only one here that's suddenly thinking of uh, basically uh, Green Acres? You know, sitting on the tractor going like this, uh, you know, dun -dun 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 you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny when when. My first tractor was an antique. We uh, did a little show on Two Guys Garage, Brian Fuller and I, where we converted it to 12 volts, put an alternator on it, and all that stuff. Because, you know, it's a 1952 model. But then eventually I bought a little diesel tractor with a front end loader. And once you have a front end loader, when you got a little bit of property and you're doing some work, you'll wonder how you ever got along without it. I, I don't think my neighbors would understand, actually. I'm in a condo, I... and if I came in with a front end loader, they'd it run i and it would probably get stolen in my neighborhood so i don't know it's in, you yeah. never know how that works the my teenagers neighbor. would be driving down the street going <laughs> crazy i tell you all right we were talking before the show about how you were kind of the pioneer of the automotive shows uh you know velocity was the automotive show place to go when you wanted to watch things and you were one of the early shows on that with the uh, with your show uh with dave bowman how did that start? Well, you know, we actually started, uh, I hate to admit it, but it was 30 years ago, October of 94, the first Shade Tree Mechanic show aired. That was on TNN, the old national network. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which was a country music station during the week. And then on the weekends, they had outdoor shows. They had the fishing and hunting shows. And um, we were pretty much the first how-to automotive show. And eventually, we did um, 190 episodes, about eight or nine years there. And then Scripps Howard bought the production company. And they didn't want to deal with the Nashville Network. So we went over to what was Speed Vision. And mm -hmm. Warner had it. That's what it was called, Speed Vision. Fox bought it and just changed it to Speed. And we did a couple years of Crank and Chrome Performance Shop. Um, okay. And then the network changed again. Velocity bought it, so it became Two Guys Garage. Do you ever notice that, especially on things like the Nashville Network, and and, and there were some other country music videos when that was still big, uh, that it seems so many classic cars were on those videos. Every every country singer had something, whether it be about love, loss, um, my mother. 
my mother hurt my dog. It had a classic car in it. I, yeah. You ever notice right. that? Yeah. Well, you're familiar with, you're familiar with uh, my buddy, Stacy David. Yep. Yes. Been on the show. Stacy is a musician. He, oh, he went to Nashville to become a musician and became the, the mechanic to the stars and started building, you know, he's done stuff for Alan Jackson, all those guys. And then started, he worked for RTM Productions out of Franklin, Tennessee, and eventually started his own show, which he has today, uh, Gears. He's a great guy with friends, and he puts that together up in Nashville. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. yeah, he has a great story about meeting uh, Johnny Cash or something like that at his house. So I'd, I'd re relate it now, but frankly, I'd rather have you go back, try to find when we had Stacy on the show. Watch it that way. It's it's pretty funny. Well, we also had Stacy at the Classic Auto Show. Yeah. Yes, that's true. So so let me ask Sam, do you miss being involved with the car stuff? I mean, is that or it's just kind of like you did it. It was fun. And it's like, oh, man, now I have uh, so much more time to do other stuff. You know, I, I started off doing cars when I was I was in diapers. OK, my dad, <laughs> we grew up in a poor Italian neighborhood. We didn't always have a car. We lived in the city. Mm -hmm. When we had a car, it was a clunker. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad, you know, he was from the old country. Uh, we're Italians and. Uh, couldn't afford to pay people to do things, so we did everything ourselves. And I can remember sitting on a milk crate, packing ball bearing wheel bearings in the front of a 49 Roadmaster, you know, uh, putting a cylinder head on an, uh, you know, an Oldsmobile with a big motor in it, whatever we needed to do. So I've been doing it for a long time, and I'm still involved, by the way. i got three projects. I haven't had a lot of time to devote to them, but I've got a 38 GMC pickup truck, Pro Street. Oh. And it's on a custom chassis, has a Jag rear, a 355, and running through a uh, um, 350 transmission. I've still got my 39 Chevy, um, which is mechanically done. It just needs, I need paint and interior. That's a four-door Master 85. Again, got a 350 in it. I use performance four-speed transmission. Um, everything, everything is new in that car. And I got a 66 Falcon wagon. <laughs> wow. 66 like Falcon it. wagon. That's cool. I like it. Yeah, it was a, um, a minor rest. I mean, a amateur restoration that some guy did up in Wisconsin. I think he was a cop. And I just bought this through a broker. It's not a bad little car. I got a 289 high performance. Got a five speed gearbox, disc brakes. I've had to fix a lot of stuff. Um, in fact, I'm about this weekend. I'm going to pull the transmission. I got to change the flywheel. The ring gear is rough and it's eating starters. Mm. Ah, it is. Ah, uh, there we go. Stay yep. There's a yeah. picture. There's yeah. Bob's yeah, we block it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just put your head right there so no one can see Stacy. Just I us. know what I'll do. Yeah. There. <laughs> Way to go there, Bob. He's a good guy. He was a fun uh, interview. He's a good weekend. guy. I've enjoyed being around around him. I still do some car shows. You know, there's a show a boy out of Tupelo, Mississippi, puts on in Panama City Beach okay. every March and every November. I normally work that show for him. Um, a couple of years ago, Stacy and his beautiful wife were down there. He you know, he wrote a children's book. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, no, did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, he wrote a children's book. It was pretty neat. He was down there promoting his book. And I was there with a friend of mine that's a U.S. Marshal uh, who has a condo down there. And um, we went to dinner, Stacy and Ray, myself, and Stacy's wife, and um, spent some time together. And Dennis Gage actually showed up to do a little videotaping. And um, I got some great pictures of me and Stacy and Dennis Gage and my buddy Ray. Wow. <laughs> All in one place in Panama. Panama City Beach. Well, that, uh, that's great. Uh, we we did the same thing. Well, kind of. We didn't go to Panama Beach. We went to Los Angeles, which is just as strange. Well, there um, are people there. Yeah, but they have a few. And we were doing the Classic Auto Show. Oh, yeah. And Randy was on stage interviewing people. And then they'd funnel them through our booth 
and we would do a second interview with the television motion picture car club group and Stacy and Dennis and so forth came through and it was uh it, you know these are people we had watched on TV and it's amazing that uh, the the conversations we could have with them and the joking around we did because uh we did it wasn't serious at all neither are we right i'm sorry what did you say which time uh, you know oh, we're all car guys we all do the same thing yes. um when i had this when we were doing the show shade tree mechanic tv was a lot different then the whole the production company the way they, it goes on the network all that stuff has changed <clears throat> excuse me when dave bowman and i uh worked together by the way he's a great guy and i can't take any credit for that show that show was his brainchild he came up with shade tree mechanic they were we didn't know each other prior to that show um mm. they weren't looking for another guy because they wanted two hosts contacted me i flew into knoxville one night got picked up at the airport by a pa and dave did too we went to a hotel and i said hi i'm sam he said hi i'm dave we had a cup of coffee we had breakfast the next morning it's i don't know 6 30 at the hotel nine o'clock we're on tv oh, oh. Hey, wow, you that's... guys clicked. You you guys just worked together well. You bounced off each other, and uh, it was great to watch. That was my first introduction to you in, in watching that show. Yeah, you know, Dave and I had just instant chemistry. Our careers are about the same, both in the corporate world and in the automotive world. They parallel each other a lot, but he was more on the performance side. Um, when he worked for Allied Signal, which was Fram Bendix Autolite. He was the motorsports manager and he had he had all the uh, purse strings for the contingency money. So whether it be World of World of Outlaws, NHRA, you know, air race, it didn't matter. Whatever racing it was, everybody loved Dave Bowman because he was like Santa Claus. When he came into <laughs> your pits, he had money for you. <laughs> I love there you that. Go. Yeah, welcome yeah. him. Yeah. How did you learn so much about the broadcasting biz in the sense that you, you had mentioned that Dave basically led the way, at least in the early part of your career, but you were in it for a long time. And I, and I think it's more than just the fact that you had some really good shows. Uh, your education about the media biz, how did that go? I never had a minute's education except for on the job, busting my fingers and stubbing my toe. Um, here, here's the deal. You know, there's a lot of things that you do in life and you're much better off with luck than you are with skill. <laughs> Dave had done a little TV before um, with Fram. Um, he, Dave had a business partner named Frank. He was the guy, if you remember the Fram commercial, pay me now, pay me later. Right. With the oil filters. Mm -hmm. And then the guys dancing in the cylinders called the auto lights. Well, yeah. that was all the brainchild of this guy named Frank McGonigal, who was a very bright marketing guy, worked for Fram. Well, when Dave decided that we were going to do, he was going to do a TV show on fashioned after this old house, sort of like the old Bob Vila thing. Mm -hmm. And see, they're all on WHDH in Boston, which is public television. And Dave was living in Rhode Island, you know, close to Boston. Frank was in Swansea, Mass. The luck was the production company was a company that used to be called Cinetel Productions. They were the very, very best in the business. They did everything first class. You know, we shot that show always. Three cameras, more lights and and. That that shop was so small. It you know, TV gives How you a different small impression, but it was, was so it? small. Oh, never mind. Well, I'll tell you how small it was. <laughs> when we once we put the lift in there, when you put a car on the lift, uh -huh. you had to walk around between the workbenches in the car. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't fancy, and that was the whole idea. You know, we had bicycles hanging up, garden hose. Uh, you know, all that stuff that everybody had. One thing about that connected us with the guys with Shade Tree Mechanic, the people that watched us, they didn't have to aspire to have anything because we had nothing.
just like mm -hmm. a guy had at home. You fix his own washing machine, you know. Uh, it just that was really a down home show. But back in the day, we were allowed. If you looked at those shows, we did one project. You know, like today we're going to put a head gasket on a four cylinder Toyota. That's what the whole show was about. You know, now it's jumped from one thing to another to another, and it's all product. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. So that's just the way it is. I, well, you said you were a field engineer. So I'm glad to be out of the TV thing. There was a lot of travel. Um, I was away from home a lot, but I learned a lot. I've had I have no regrets. It was a wonderful, fun time. Dave Bowman and I still stay in touch to this day. Uh, he retired. He builds black powder firearms that will knock your eyes out. They're the most beautiful from scratch. Wow. Makes you know, Does the wood himself, builds all the parts. Oh yeah, he's he's a real aficionado. He goes to that museum up in Cincinnati, uh, Kentucky, wherever it is, and he's got he's in with the curator, so he's able to take pictures of the old masters, and then duplicate them. He does a wonderful job. Wow! All right, you said you were a field engineer. Uh, do you mind saying for for what company? Yeah, the Swedish car people call Saab, ah. which is now out of business because. General Motors bought them and ruined them, but uh, yeah. In in New England, New England's a big foreign car country. I worked as a Jaguar mechanic. I worked on Toyota, Rover, Land Rover, Vanden Plaats, uh, you name it. I mean Armstrong, Siddeley. You probably probably never heard of one of those, but um, Super Snipes. But eventually, I went to work at the Saab shop. Back in the days when there were two cycle engines, the old two stroke Saab. Yeah, three cylinder. That, that was yeah. a cult car. Yeah, yeah, that was a cult car because it was always popular in a place where they had snow, ski country. All of New England, big in Chicago area, big in Denver, um, and I was one of their lead mechanics. They were having problems with the new cars they introduced when they put them on the West Coast, particularly. Nobody could fix them. So they, the company came to me, and I was in a dealership. And they said, how'd you like to travel? And well, would, you'll do wonderful things. And I was too young and stupid to realize I was doing it for next to nothing, but I did it. <laughs> Been there, done that. I understand completely. I was in another division of that same company. So Bob lives in California. I'm sure you've had some interesting adventures there. You mentioned you were also in an area which included Washington State. Do you remember anything about being in Washington State? Any story that you might be able to relate about being up here or that you'll admit to that you'll admit to um, <laughs> or think, it's just a place well, i love i loved uh well I, you know I, I had a good friend that owned a company up in uh seattle mm -hmm. um and i liked going over to tacoma you know that's where uh the guy that sells all the high dollar waxes the mail order stuff right Grio's okay. garage, richard Grio. right yeah. He's got that old Coca-Cola plant in Tacoma. Right. It, right. It, that he re resurrected. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, the food in Washington State was good. I've enjoyed it. Uh, what's that other museum? The LeMay oh, yes, Museum? Yes, yes. Yes, there's several of those. Yes, sir. In fact, right here there's is one the... one up uh, there. It, it's, yes. It's near Tacoma, isn't it? Yes, it's in, it's in Tacoma. In fact, this picture behind me, right. behind me is actually in the LeMay Museum. So yeah, it's his cars too. My cars, but yeah, they're in the museum. But enough about me, really. It's no, no, but enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about your first car. What was your first uh, set of wheels? My very first car didn't even have a license. Then I was fourteen. I bought a forty-six Ford Club Coupe. Um, that was a pretty interesting car. Obviously, it was a flathead V eight. Um, I remember this specifically the radio, it was almost like the old Wonder Bar radio. But if you remember, and I know you guys aren't old enough to remember dimmer switches on the floor for headlines. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not old. I'm being, I'm being kind. <laughs> um, this, this Ford had two of them. There were two dimmer switches on the floor. Wow. One of them changed the radio stations. Oh, okay. No, yeah, that was my I, very I, first car. And I put, uh, you know, a set of Oppenhauser heads on it. 
a cam Johnson adjustable lifters and um, you know, three Strombergs on it, all that good stuff. And, and just ran the heck out of it in the backwoods of a little town called Marshfield, Massachusetts, down on the beaches. What about the car that got away? The car that you, uh, you've probably gone through a bunch of them. What is the car that you no longer have that you would like back someday? 63 Catalina Tudor hardtop 421 triples four speed eight lug wheels from the factory. Wow. Gorgeous. Dark blue, the tuxedo blue, I think mm. they called it. Uh -huh. That was just, it was fast. A um, little heavy, but fast. Um, couldn't stop it because it had drum brakes, but it was the most pleasurable car to drive. You're talking Randy's language here. He's got well, big, not yeah. only am I a Pontiac guy, but I just happen to be the president of the Puget Sound Pontiac Club. So, yeah, I uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And I did yeah. not, I just want to say, I did not tell him in advance to say that. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Well, I saw that, that <laughs> poncho behind you. Oh yes, that, yeah. There you go. That's the pot. That that's poncho behind you. And you know, um, if I could, that's gorgeous. That is gorgeous. Um, I have a friend that has a '58 Bonneville wagon that knock your eyes out. Mm -hmm. And he passed away a while back, and I have no idea what happened to his car. No, I have not talked to his wife, his widow, but uh, that was just. There was something about a Pontiac wagon, 56, 57, 58, um, even the 59. They're gorgeous cars. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So everybody has a list of cars they want. You know, something like, what are the top 10 cars you wanted? And uh, what are the chances that you're going to get one? Do you have a, Do you have such a list? Or, and if so, what are maybe the top? three cars on your list? Well, you know, there's a joke about working on high dollar cars yeah. <laughs> that I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> you know, I work sure on, I work, this is a podcast. I work on a lot you. of high dollar cars. Yeah. I'm sorry? No, I was going to say, this is a podcast. You can tell me anything, really. And, and we're editing it, so we can always change um, it later. Well, it, it's the guy sitting there and he's having a beer and and a gal sits beside him and she says, your hands are pretty dirty. What do you do for a living? He says, I work on high dollar cars, real expensive cars. She goes, oh, that must be exciting. He said, no, it's pretty depressing, actually. She says, why is it depressing? He said, because the, the feel, the smell. He said, and knowing that I could never own one, I could never afford one. He said, in fact, I can't even take one for a spin. It's depressing. And the little girl said, yeah, my brother has the same problem. He said, is he a mechanic? She said, no, he's a gynecologist. Oh! <laughs> hey, hey. Hey. Yes, that's fine. Hey, I like it. Thank there we you. Go. Sam Amato, ladies and gentlemen. He'll be here all show. I just thought Send I'd... your hate mail to Randy <laughs> Bernoon. <laughs> no, <Here>. it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, very good, Sam. Very that's good. good. I You're warned gonna... you. That's yeah, fine. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I always wanted... I always wanted a 4.2 E-type Jag convertible. Oh, like yeah. Like nice. pre-emissions nice. when they had the SU carburetors before they had the Stromberg's 175 CD2s on them. Yeah. Great car. You know, it was a four-speed car that, and they were wonderful automobiles. People said, oh, Jag broke all the time. Said nobody knew how to fix them right. But you could take that car in first gear and ease in at the second, third, put it in fourth gear on level surface, at 20 miles an hour, mm -hmm. put your foot to the floor, and you never shift it again, and you'd be going 120, 125. That 4.2 was a wonderful engine. I had a, a, a 120, and it was similar, but it was like, that, that car was like driving a truck. Uh, it was not as nimble as the E-types. Yeah, the E-types were, were really, yeah, I... I've worked on the old 120, 120 rows, the, the drop head coupes, the 150s. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, if you remember a guy who was a jazz drummer, Buddy Rich. Yep. Remember Buddy Rich? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he used to do all the clubs on Cape Cod, 
in New England, Nantasca, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. Um, he had a 120 drop head that I used to work on. He would play all night in these clubs, get drunk, and drive, try to drive home in the dark. <laughs> Invariably, uh, I was putting a lot of front ends under that car, but um, that's another story. But anyway, I also got a chance to work on Aston Martins and a DB5 and a DB6 Aston Martin. is another fun car that I would love to have owned. Um, I came real close to getting a Maserati Mistral one time. Mm. I worked on these things because sure, I worked with a British kid named Brian Morton who came from Manchester, England. He knew these cars. He taught me a lot. And we were just doing these on the side and, you know, just building transmissions. I became so proficient at the overdrive that we used in the Jags and used in the Austin Healy 3000. That was a French made unit called uh, Lake Hawk de Normanville. Yep. And I used to build those all the time. There was nothing to them once you learned them. Yeah, very yeah. simple. So. Yeah. Those are some of the cars I'd like to have. And if I had a chance to have a sports car today, I have no use for a sports car. Mm -hmm. But I would have one of those Austin Healey 3000 replicas. I'm trying to think what they're called. Oh, Sebring. They're called Sebring. Yes. They either have a small block Ford or a small block Chevy in them. They're an awesome car, faster than most Cobras. Yeah. Uh, they're interesting cars. No question about it. Uh, wow. Sam Amolo joining us here on the broadcast. Uh, and, and Sam, it's been great having you on. We have a skill that you have that has served you well, not only in the garage, but let's say behind the microphone. Well, if you, if you really watched me on television, you could tell I was not a polished television professional. I had never done a minute's television prior to Shade Tree Mechanic. If you can break it, I've broken it. If you can hurt yourself, I've hurt myself. And I was like, here, yeah, this is what I do. I never used to tell people, by the way, let me show you how to do it. I don't believe in that. Let me show you what works for me. If there's a guy out there watching that's much smarter than I am, and he's going, this guy's doing it the hard way. I can do it a lot easier. <laughs> and that's why two heads are better than one. Mm -hmm. And I know that's why you keep Hot Rod Bob around. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> just fun, just fun, and Bob. No problem, no but, problem. Uh, Understand? Uh, you know, I just wanted, I just wanted people to take, you know, take advantage of the good stuff that I've done and the bad stuff too, so they don't hurt themselves and don't spend a lot of money on something they don't need to. Yeah. Well, that that kind of I think is why one of the appeals that you have is because. You're not a guy that gets up there and starts saying, well, this is the way to do it, and it's the only way to do it. And you, if you make mistakes, it actually makes people feel more realistic about wanting to work on their own cars, too, learning from you. Because, hey, the guy's not perfect, and I know I'm not perfect. So uh, between the two of us, hey, there's a shot here this thing could get fixed. Yeah, and, you know, I've had... I've been really lucky in my career to have worked with some of the best people in the business. And I'm like a sponge. If you know something, I'm going to ask you questions. So you hate me. Um, <laughs> there was a guy, who, this was international, but FIA mechanic of the year, a guy named Terry Secker that a lot of people never heard of, but he was, um, um, well, that's what's Skip Barber's chief mechanic. When Skip Bob was running the Traco Chevy McLaren in Group 7, mm -hmm. well, I worked in that shop. Now, I was what they called the grunt. I got to clean the pan, change the heim joints. And when you back in the, those days, that was points ignition. And um, we, when the car, engine was in the car to set it up, one guy in the cockpit holding the throttle, watching that had a chronometric tack, one guy turning the distributor, and then there was me, the guy that got to stand between the spaghetti headers with the timing light and go this way, that way, and advance or retard at 6,000 RPM. And then people wonder, well, I don't hear. People say, you're deaf. And I, I know that. And that's one of the reasons I'm deaf, because we didn't know about hearing protection and stuff back then. No, but no. Uh, this guy, Terry Secker, was an awesome, awesome guy. And, and I'm dating myself here because... 
I'm way up there, but I used to work with a guy named Oscar, who was a mechanic for Gaston Andre. Back in the days, of, he and Bob Columbosian ran Lister Buicks, Buick Allards, Lister Jags. He had a birdcage Maserati. And I got to work with Oscar, his, his crew chief. And I've worked with a couple of crew chiefs on monster trucks, which I don't even care about monster trucks. But boy, they're unbelievable pieces of equipment. Yeah, the the technology that goes into that is just as exciting when you look at it from a technical standpoint. I mean, those things are jumping and landing, and they're not breaking in most cases. Uh, but, you know, 10,000 pounds of steel, and they're doing amazing acrobatics. Yeah, they're absolutely all implement differentials and all that stuff. Not only do I have to transport it in a trailer, but I got to take all the wheels off and put little bitty wheels on it to put it in the trailer because the big tires don't fit in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on a truck called Blown Thunder. Okay. And an old drag racer used to have it. And he did exhibition shows. He took it to England. And, you know, they don't have a society where everybody sues you because they don't like the way your glasses fit your head. Um, they sold rides in the monster truck. He put a second seat in it, some promoter. And the guy told me, he said, they were lined up like a bread line in Russia, paying big dollars, lots of pounds to get in this monster truck. And he took them out and banged them up and down till they got sick, whatever. <laughs> it was so successful, the promoter bought his truck on the spot. Doug came home from England without the truck. Months later, the promoter called and said, I need another one. So they built another truck and shipped it to England. Uh, and that's what they were doing, selling monster truck rides. And it was a, it was like a carnival. They were making a ton of money. No, that's great. Uh, oh, it, yeah, it's a whole different market. Uh, yeah, I'm going to – we'll find out what their drag racing is like over there. The the biggest track there is Santa Pod. And the, the innovation you see there hmm. with British-powered dragsters I think is amazing, where they'll put a Jag motor in, the, in a front-engine dragster or four cylinders, uh, you know, a Triumph standard motor or, or something of that nature. And uh, then you see them, you know, if they aspire real well, they get an American car. So we, we, we yeah, definitely it is have amazing. That. Like even in the Scandinavian, the Scandinavian countries have got unbelievable hot rods. Uh, yeah. And our friends to the north up in Canada, I did a hot rod show um, at a agri, agri center, it was called, big agricultural mm -hmm. center. In Alberta, Canada, mm -hmm. um, and it was it, it was the quality of the hot rods and the custom cars there blew me away. Those guys had there was a Mopar group there that had you know GTXs and Roadrunners and all that stuff. Every one of them was gorgeous, mm -hmm. and you know those poor guys they got to spend a fortune to get everything out of America in taxes and tariffs. It's as bad as the boys in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, but they get nine months to work on them because they can't get out of the garage because it's snowed in. <laughs> you know, and they've done that. We live in a world, Sam, that the mechanics are are becoming fewer and fewer in the world, especially for those of us who may be a little uh, engineering challenge when it comes to working on our classics. Any suggestions on what people should do as far as or, or how to get more people, more young people to get involved in the world of uh, auto mechanics from a simple standpoint and also guys who eventually want to take it into hot rod status? You're right. We went in the wrong direction for a long time, getting rid of trade schools and all that stuff. It's coming back. Mike Rowe does a great job promoting yes. that. Uh, more and more people are realizing not just auto mechanics, tradesmen in general. If you want a good carpenter, I'm not talking about somebody with a pickup truck and a hammer, a really good carpenter, virtually non-existent. If you find a guy, he's six months out or a year out, and he's 100 bucks an hour, and uh, an electrician's the same way. I'm actually a pretty fair electrician, um, and I, I don't want to work in anybody's houses. I don't want the liability. But I still do teach electrical classes. If you talk to guys that go to the car shows, I put on a, a, a thing I call it, Voltmeter 101, okay? Because these guys can build these cars. They put a, a Volari front end on this chassis, put a Ford engine, 
they got all this mishmashed up and it works. They can paint them. They can do all the stuff. But the wiring is, just, and it's, it's, you know, it, they just do, don't do a great job. Um, so I do this voltmeter one on one, and one of the things I do, I have fun with this, by the way. Um, I've done them all over the country. Um, I start off with a test light. I hold up a brand new twelve volt test light <clears throat> by the light, and I ask everybody in the audience, "How many of you guys have got one of these?" Naturally, everybody puts their hand up, and I say, "Well, this is broken. There's only one way to fix it. I reach in my pocket, I pull out a pair of side cutters." <laughs> And I cut the wire off it and it falls to the ground. And they gasp. They go, he just ruined a perfectly good test light. And now it's fixed. Because the only thing it's good for is an ice pick. Put it in the beer, the ice in the beer and the cooler. Don't use it on your car. <laughs> and then I hold up the voltmeter. And I go, you know, I have no idea how this thing got its name, voltmeter, because the voltmeter can't measure voltage. And at that point, they start to think, this guy's drunk, you know. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm going to prove to you, voltmeter can't measure voltage. And then I got a little test stand, and it's got a horn on it. Hook a 12-volt 12 12 volt battery, and I touch one post, and the horn beeps. I touch the other post, and the horn doesn't beep. I said, what's wrong? And, you know, they got, they got a bad ground, bad horn. I said, the horn beeps. So here's the problem. The problem is there's no voltage at one of these posts. So the wire, you touch it here, that, that's like your horn button. Touch it here and it doesn't beep. And I go, you, come on up here, put them in a 20-volt scale. Measure the voltage here, and it's battery voltage. Mm -hmm. Measure the voltage here where it doesn't beep, and guess what? It's battery voltage. Now nobody knows what's going on. And that, because you're not measuring voltage, you're measuring voltage potential. And I, I'm, you know, talking to the choir here, but... Anyway, I do this thing, and I spend about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. I do a whole bunch of different stuff, talk about wire gauges and so on. What the purpose is, and I have to go away with one thing. That's what my goal is, how to do a dynamic voltage drop test. If they can do that, they can fix 60%, 70% of the problems that they have with their car. Okay. Electric. Interesting. Interesting. I go sign up for that class. <laughs> The people are shocked how bad of an electrician I am. The commute would kill you, Bob. I just that's just <laughs> me. But I, you know, you could leave now, I think, for his next uh next step in a class. It'd be and, something. Yeah, if I start driving now, my car will break down about halfway there. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And I'll you have a project it. to work on. That's it. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Wow. These are great stories, Sam. I mean, appreciate and, you know, it. Go ahead. Everything is getting touched by some kind of a processor. Um, I have a lot of lawn. So I had a little John Deere riding mower, just like you see. You, know, you won't see it in California because it's got, it's got gas in it, you know. But anyway, yeah, there you go, Bob. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I bought a zero-turn mower. Nice little zero-turn mower. Uh, it's like a 48-inch cut. I used it a couple years. It was fine. I used it on a Saturday. And then I was going to take it down to, I, I cut grass for a library. I helped them out a little bit. So I, that was the last thing I put in the garage. So the next day, I backed my trailer up, jumped on the zero turn, and I twisted the key. Nothing. The only thing that worked was the gas gauge. So I said, oh, the battery went down overnight. I took up my voltmeter. Battery's fine. I started troubleshooting, and, I, and you know, the thing was new. I mean, I'd had it a couple of years. I was out of warranty. I opened it up. It had a wire harness like an F-15. I said, you got to be kidding me. It turns out it had a little digital processor in there. Everything goes in, and then there's a lot of outputs. Well, nothing was coming out. I, I hot-wired the starter, and the starter turned. I, I did a bunch of things, and I, and I knew if I bought this electronic box, which is probably going to be $250 or more, that I owned it because it's electrical, you're not bringing it back. And I was unsure, but I did my best diagnosis. I went and bought one. Of course, I had to order it. And it was funny because the dealer that sells these things had never had one fail. I plugged it in and everything works fine. It's been working fine ever since, but it's a zero turn lawnmower and it's got a digital processor. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> complications. Uh that's the problem with getting some of the engineers we've got today. They overthink. 
and they they make things more complicated than they need to be. Yeah, between the engineers and the bean counters, we always fight that battle. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like some of these new cars. I mean, you can't do anything to them without having a zillion dollars worth of really high dollar uh, bi directional scan tools. And you got to do waveform analysis. It, it's pretty intense. And you're right, it's hard to find good guys that know what they're doing. Yeah, I'm afraid, by the way, that we're going to see the end of v eight. I think this is going to be the last year for a Hemi and a Chrysler. Yeah, um, Hemi's gone. Yeah, and you know, yeah. canceled it. They canceled the Hemi. The everything is, look, 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 look at the Chevy pickup truck. They're selling a half ton pickup truck, which I drive a Silverado with a five three in it. But yeah. a half ton Chevy pickup truck. Now it's got this thing called the Turbo Max. It's yeah. a four cylinder engine, and it's rated at four hundred and twenty foot pounds of torque. Well, heck, you know. We get a lot of power out of an engine when we drag race, but how long does it live? Yeah. yeah. Well, and they've gotten relatively good on that, uh, but it's still a situation where you need the you need the torque, you need the power of that V8. Um, it, it, they're not getting away from that. Oh, Chrysler's dumped the Hemi. That's gone. Uh, they're going to replace it uh, later on this year or early next year with what they're calling the Hurricane 6. And it's a turbocharged six cylinder putting out 425 horsepower. It's still a six, and it's still what we replaced with V8s because they just don't live. Yeah. Well, the same with a Ford F 150. Most yeah. of them have a three and a half liter V6 EcoBoost twin turbo. Right. God, you get under the hood of that thing, and it's so complex. If you need to change it, Help cover gasket. You got to spend three days taking stuff off it. Crazy. Yep. You guys have to excuse me. I got to go. My yep. new uh, Tesla truck is being delivered. <laughs> don't wash. Don't wash it. The latest news from Tesla is you get out wash the new truck. It yeah. rusts and yeah. it won't run. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Aside from that, yeah, no, it's it's so true. And heaven forbid you do anything to your to its gas pedal, then you're in big trouble. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, Sam, we appreciate the time. Exactly. We appreciate the time. It's been a lot of fun having you on the show. Uh, don't forget to I've follow us. I've had fun. Thanks. Thank, thank you. No, follow us everybody I've on had social fun. media. It's been great talking to both of you guys. Thanks, sir. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, uh, which is now X, uh, Facebook, Instagram, wherever else you find us. Our website is Watch pttv.com uh, that's Sam Mamolo in Alabama is shinbone territory there hot rod bobs in California I'm here in our studios in Washington State having fun talking I'll, about cars do it. new episodes Thanks, drop sir. every Wednesday and watch on powertubetv.com Roku, Amazon Fire Android TV, Smart TV, Apple TV Android TV, Google Play Rumble and YouTube.com join us next time we'll see you on our next Talking About Cars Power Tube TV. Take care. Like this show? Want more? Then head to watchpttv.com, the new 100% free PowerTube TV streaming network. Home of the best classic and new motorsports racing and build shows on the web.